Kena, Mabuika, Dituno, Kena, Dati Aono, Diri Mukaro, Aguebana, Boriken Taino Daka. Greetings and welcome, uh, everyone, uh, relatives. My name is Roberto Borrero. I'm from the Taino Nation, and it's my honor to serve as the moderator for today's IITC webinar. Uh, protecting and Restoring Our Traditional Food and Ecosystems, Practical Knowledge Sharing with Indigenous Peoples. This is our fourth session, Restoring Original Biodiversity and Removing Invasive Species. I'm just going to uh, repeat that in Spanish, and then I will share the instructions for the Zoom interpretation feature. So, uh, saludos y bienvenidos a Hermanos y hermanas, mi nombre es Roberto Mucaro Borrero, soy del pueblo taíno y tengo el honor de servir como moderador de este webinario de CITI, uh, protección y restauración de nuestros alimentos y ecosistemas tradicionales, intercambio de conocimientos con los pueblos indígenas, sesión 4, restauración de la biodiversidad original y la eliminación de especies invasores. Ahora voy a compartir las instru instrucciones para la plataforma de Zoom, para la, la interpretación, primero en inglés y después en español. Uh, paciencia, por favor. So right now, I'm just going to go over the Zoom interpretation feature in English first, and then I'll go over it in Spanish. Uh, let me just uh, get my screen share operational here. Just a minute, you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, if you look at this image here, uh, you'll see that you need to locate the interpretation icon. So that looks like a little globe. It's at the bottom of your screen, uh, more towards the right. You need to click on that. After you click on that little globe where it says interpretation, you want to select English. The next thing you want to do, and this is very important, is mute original audio. So select English, then select mute original audio. If you don't do that, you'll hear both the speaker and the interpreter at the same time, and it'll be difficult to follow the, the program. Um, here again, here are some images just so that you can see what that looks like. Select English and then mute original audio. So please just allow just a few more moments of patience. I'm going to switch this over uh, to the Spanish instructions uh if they're up here oh that's the english again let's see Move this okay so now we have the instructions in spanish ahora voy a compartir los instrucciones de interpretación de la plataforma de zoom en español primero Localiza el icono de interpretación. Está en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. Aquí puede ver uh, por la imagen uh, el globito. Dice interpretación abajo. Y primero seleccione español Spanish. Aquí es otra imagen donde tú puedes ver. English, Spanish. Seleccione español primero y después seleccione Mute original audio, que quiere decir apaga el audio original, y esto es muy importante, si no vas a escuchar el presentador y el intérprete en el mismo vez. Ok, ahora voy a volverle en inglés porque tenemos interpretación. Gracias por su paciencia. Thank you for your patience. I'm going to stop the screen share, and we're going to get right into our program. Thank you uh, again for your patience. And for those of you who are tuning in a little bit later after my instructions, you'll notice that the interpretation instructions are also shared in the chat. So right now, I want to introduce our first speaker, who is Andrea Carmen. She's from the Yaki Nation. She's the executive director of the International Indian Treaty Council, and she'll be providing the introduction for today's program. Andrea, you have the floor. 
Yokwe Utesia, Robert, Roberto, and Leo Simchani Abo Umawayaim um, to everyone um, who is uh, listening in and also to our distinguished panel of speakers. This is the International Indian Treaty Council's third webinar series. Uh, the first focused on the rights of Indigenous peoples in the time of COVID. And we had eight different um, webinars. And uh, the next one was um, looking ahead to life after COVID. Uh, what are we learning from this experience? Uh, what do we want to strengthen uh, in our Indigenous peoples communities? And what do we need to let go of? What's the lesson um, that we're learning? And this third series um, was called for by Indigenous peoples that we really give uh, our knowledge holders and practitioners an opportunity to share practical knowledge, practical methods that they're using in their own community uh, to strengthen our relationship with our original food systems and our ecosystems. Uh, we recall that um, Article 31 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples affirms the inherent right of Indigenous peoples uh, to maintain, control, and develop our cultural heritage. And it also specifically mentions seeds and knowledge of flora and fauna. And those elements uh, are key to our survival, uh, our nutrition, um, our identity, our ceremonial life, and our ways of knowing. And it's very important, this connection um, to our very identity, and also exercising our responsibility to take care of those things in our original homelands uh, that the Creator has given us to survive. It's uh, really important to talk about how we restore and protect our original biodiversity because our homelands uh, have suffered the same kind of colonization as we have. In fact, it goes hand in hand. And there's a lot of introduction of species um, that have been brought in that has really uh, laid waste to many of our traditional ecosystems. You'll notice on our flyer, it's a picture of a very hungry looking tilapia. And I first heard about the impact of the tilapia fish, which is served in all kinds of restaurants, as we know, um, by some indigenous peoples in Mexico. And they said that uh, it was a, an organization uh, that brought it in and said they grow really fast, they produce protein, this will help with your people's nutrition. And um, the presenter said that within five years, they had no more of their traditional original fish or even frogs and salamanders and even some of the birds because the tilapia just ate everything and that's all they had left. So they realized, you know, that they hadn't understood what the effect of this was. So I know we're going to hear more about that um, from our presenters, but I just wanted to show, um, ask Chris to show a picture that I took last night um, and how we need to also understand how to engage um, in making sure that we're restoring and protecting our original biodiversity. These are some pumpkins that we grew here on our little family farm last year. They grew very, very well in spite of because of climate change it being the hottest, driest summer in the history of Tucson, Arizona, and you know it's a hot, dry place, but this was extreme. But they grew very well because they're from here. We got the seeds from the Tone Autumn. And um, look how beautiful they are, and they're very delicious. And there's some seeds from um, one that we just ate. They keep for a long time as well, um, just out, out of the refrigerator and you know on, on the table. They, they last for a long time. And this is an example of our traditional biological diversity and how it fits so well with our way of life here and also can be used to adapt to and protect us from the impacts of climate change, which is affecting uh, many of our plants and animals. Next slide, I just want to show you what genetically modified pumpkins look like that we all buy for uh, Halloween. Um, nothing in nature that's natural is going to be that color and that kind of perfection. Um, and we have to just be aware and make sure that our children know, you know, what is from us 
and what comes from somewhere else. And again, these are just a picture I found of genetically modified pumpkin. And you can see the difference. Um, they almost look like they're plastic, they, that they're manufactured. And in a way, they are. Um, and my final slide, uh, I'll just show you one of the things that uh, International Indian Treaty Council is doing to restore our original biodiversity that goes along with our trade relationships that we always had before colonization with each other. We traded seeds. This is a picture um, from our second International uh, Indigenous Peoples Corn Conference. It was held in Oklahoma. And it's uh, Indigenous peoples from Mexico, Guatemala, and the United States exchanging seeds and um, bringing back seeds that maybe were ours originally because we always traded with each other. So there's a lot that we can do among each other to, to restore our original biodiversity and our original uh, trade relations with each other. Uh, with that, I don't want to take more time from our distinguished panel of speakers who are all working in their homelands on bringing back the original food sources, uh, restoring um, the original biodiversity and, and um, ecosystems, and uh, bringing back cultural practices um, and our identity, our food sovereignty. Uh, that goes along with uh, hand in hand with bringing back and protecting our original um, ecosystems and the totality of our ways of knowing about those things. So thank you very much. Um, that's my introduction and I pass the floor back to our distinguished moderator, uh, Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Thank you. Choque Otesia and welcome everybody. Home. Thank you, my sister Andrea, uh, for that wonderful introduction and for reminding folks uh, the connection uh, to this subject and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, you can find that declaration at the IITC website. We'll share a link in a little bit. And uh, also for highlighting that difference between those genetically modified uh, seeds and the, and the products and, and reminding us of that. So as Andrea said, we have a stellar uh, line of speakers uh, here for you today. And our first speaker is Puhonua Bumpi Kanaheli. Of the, he's the head of state of the Hawaiian uh, nation. He's the spokesperson of the sovereign nation state of Hawaii. So Bumpi, uh, just unmute yourself. You have the floor. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Aloha. Hello, everyone. Um, E ho ano luna e pi ano lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapai that that was a little uh, a kapihe's uh, testament uh, one of our ancestors that uh, foresaw the 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 people that was lowly or lived down will rise up and all those above will fall and there was a little presentation for us. Native, Indigenous, Aboriginal peoples. Anyway, good morning uh, from Hawaii, uh, off the land of the nation of Hawaii. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, touch upon, I, I think the basis for all Indigenous peoples uh, regarding their land. If uh, I'm just going straight to it. Um, Chris, if you can uh, put up that, that first, uh, uh, that first photo that I have. Uh, okay, thank you. So this, uh, wrong one. This is basically a ahupua'a system uh, from the mountain to the ocean. Uh, this is what it was like prior to colonization. Uh, my guess is uh, that it was probably a system in every uh, indigenous people's uh, lands throughout the world. Uh, the, the, the good part about explaining uh, uh, what this means, uh, say from a short view, because uh, in the islands, you know, ocean is right around us. So we can actually see the Ahupua'a system, like we're in Waimanalo. When we look down to the ocean, we can see the other end. 
Um, and, and, and so that gives us in Hawaii a very, very uh, uh, much easier time to start restoring, start to identify exactly what took place uh, in, in history. Now, this old uh, uh, shot of an Aupa system, I'm sure every uh, indigenous people had the same thing. And if you look on the bottom of uh, close to the ocean, uh, you normally would see that someplace like in Louisiana, Alabama, you know, all uh, the lower uh, areas. Uh, uh, if you look at America and uh, Chris, can you go to that next shot? Okay, this is the old system on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the screen. This is currently, the middle one is currently where the village is at, that white arrow on the top is where the nation of Hawaii is located. Now, watch that stream. That is Waimanalo stream that goes all the way down past the golf course, past the highways, past all the development that once had tarot patches and fish ponds and villages and a military base on the bottom. That is our current uh, situation right now. Now, if you look on the very far right, the third uh, uh, section, uh, I, I guess the top is like Minnesota up in Canada and it comes down the Mississippi River all the way down to Louisiana, yeah? Now that, what, what I'm trying to get at is imagine the relationship that took place from north to south, from east to west, uh, especially in America. And I wanted to point out that, that for us in Hawaii, our, our, we can see our system. You can't just look from Canada and you're gonna see Louisiana on the other end, right? In, in Hawaii, we can see our Mississippi River going from the mountain to the ocean. And we can see what was destroyed. You look at the first two slides or the two sections, it really describes an exact, pretty much an exact destruction of a indigenous native Aboriginal water system from the mountain to the ocean. Now, imagine the relationship when regards to America that took place from Canada down to uh, Louisiana. And, and I bet you they knew each other because they had to be traveling upstream, downstream. They had to be trading from the mountain to the ocean, from east to west uh, in every area. Uh, so the destruction, when you look at, at the first section again, the destruction is, is so devastating that in, it, it included uh, the See to have a lag in the audio. Maybe Bumpy could turn off his camera and um, we'll be able to hear the audio better. This happens sometimes when we don't have the greatest interaction. Bumpy, are you muted or, or? Let's see, I think. I think we just lost Bumpy on the connection. Just confirming that with Chris. Yeah, looks like uh, Bumpy dropped off. Yes, yeah, it looks like he did. All right, so why don't we uh, go to our next speaker and then when Bumpy comes on, we could let him you know, finish up. Does that sound okay, Andrea? All right, all right, um, so Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Sometimes 
because these things happen. This is technology. This is the what we deal with in these days. But I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Irvin Carlson. He's from the Blackfeet Nation. He's the president of the Intertribal Buffalo Council, in Montana. Irvin, it's good to see you. Uh, we're really uh, honored that you're here with us. And uh, when you're ready, please begin. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here and, and speak with um, everybody and, and talk about uh, um, about the uh, what we're doing here. Um, the, where I'm from, from the Blackfeet tribe uh, here in Montana. Uh, as as was said, I'm I'm uh, from the Blackfeet Nation here in uh, Browning, Montana. We live right next to. We border the Canadian. Uh, right on the Canadian border, and we're right under the east slopes of the the Rocky Mountains um, in the Glacier National Park. Um, I run uh, the Buffalo program here um, at the Blackfeet, but I'm also um, and here today. Uh, speaking on behalf too of the Inner Tribal Buffalo Council. And I kind of wanted to let you know, um, everybody know what the Inner Tribal Buffalo Council is. Uh, I'm the president of the organization. Um, I've been with that organization since 1996 and uh, been the president, I think, for um, oh, about three quarters of the existence of the organization. Um, the Intertribal Buffalo Council was organized in uh, 1992, and we were um, under a, a state uh, um, organization, and we are now a uh, Section uh, 17 uh, federally recognized organization. Uh, the organization, um, there are 70 tribes right now that are part of the, the ITBC. Um, and uh, 54 of, of those 70 tribes that are part of the organization um, have buffalo herds. And um, our, um, our uh, statement, you know, uh, is we're returning buffalo back to Indian country um, for our cultural, our spiritual, um, and traditional connection to the animal. And uh, so the organization has been uh, mainly about returning uh, Buffalo back to, to Indian country. And I, in, in my talks, I always talk about too, uh, well, where is Indian country? Well, this whole United States or, or this whole um, North American continent is, is, uh, is Indian country. And um, we're all native to this. And I just kind of wanted to throw in, it was, um, yeah, um, about invasive species here within our lands and uh, kind of a thing I always like to think about on my mind is uh, the invasive species um, where the non-indigenous people to this this continent and also to the uh, um, the cattle the cattle that we do now have. to me those are uh, the invasive species um, which brings us to where um, we as Indian people here, um, we have lost a, a lot of things um, that uh, when we are invaded, I guess, um, our way of life. Um, and to us, in, in, in especially in my area, the Great Plains area is the, the uh, buffalo were uh, our food, our clothing, our lodging, um, they were our tools. And uh, we used them for uh, ceremonies. Our ceremonies, they were a big part of that. Uh, very, very highly um, held, you know, in our ceremonies. Um, and that's what our people survived on, was the buffalo. And that's what the ITBC is about, is, is returning all of those, uh, the cultural connection, the spiritual connection, and then also getting our, our people back to, um, to eat, eating a, a healthy, um, a healthy meat. Buffalo is, um, uh, the grass-fed buffalo is the healthiest meat that you, you can eat. Um, back in our, our earlier days, uh, our people didn't have uh, diabetes, which is rampant now in Indian country, um, didn't have um, 
any, you know, the heart diseases um, and all of those that come along with um, nowadays eating the fat, uh, the fattened uh, marbled uh, cattle that they have changed our, our diets to throughout the years. So buffalo have been gone, you know, from, from uh, um, our tribes for so many years, you know, that um, it's taken a while now to get, uh, get our people back to use, used to um, revering them as our, as our healthy food and as a big part of our culture that was taken away from us. So that's a real big um, goal of ITBC is to, uh, to restore those to, to Indian country. Um, we at ITBC, we, um, we, uh, we help people you know, with, uh, we have uh, um, we uh, help people there. We have an agreement with the National Park Services and uh, mainly in North Dakota and South Dakota and in Montana also. And uh, when they have surplus animals, uh, they um, give those to, uh, we have an agreement where they go to ITBC and we um, in turn, um, our people will, um, tribes will um, do an application for uh, surplus animals. And um, when we get those animals there, then we ship those on out to the tribes that want to start a new herd or to increase the herd that they have. And, um, and we've been doing this for a, a lot of years, you know, and we've, like I say, we were formed in, in 1992 and we're going on 30 years of existence, of being in existence and returning these animals back to, to Indian country. So there's, um, in the beginning, there's a lot of our tribes that, that are um, in different um, stages of um, their buffalo herds. Some of them want to just keep their animals and mainly for the cultural purposes. And there's some of the, the uh, tribes with the bigger land base and um, that are economically strapped, such as my tribe. Um, it's a big tribe. We have a uh, 1. million um, acre reservation. We have uh, nearly 17,000 members. And, um, you know, we're not a, you know, casino tribe or any of that. We're too remote. And so there's a lot of issues. That, so we help tribes too while they're looking at the Buffalo also as um, economics and of, of um, being able to market them to, uh, to help uh, revenue for the tribe. Um, and that's a real big thing, you know, it's, I always look at uh, how Buffalo were, you know, like I said earlier, were our, um, they were our existence, they were our economy. They were, like I say, they were food and clothing. They were everything to us. And they took care of us in, in our early days and I always look at them now as um, taking care of us in, in a new way. Um, um, of course, getting back to the healthy side of eating these animals, but also being able to help on the economic side to help a financially strapped tribe who doesn't, uh, has a lot of people to take care of um, and doesn't have a lot of um, big resources. And, and so this is something I, I've always preached. I've said on, our tribal council also, and uh, I've uh, and you're always looking for ways, you know, to to help your people, you know, through these economic times, and uh, and I always um, bring bring up that you know what do we have, you know, left here is our land, and then uh, why and, and we utilize, you know, we always have these big ideas of of economic development, but. First and foremost, we have our land here and that's what we should, that's our base and, and, and build your economy from that land because we have that day in and day out. Uh, we now have, you know, a good size herd of buffalo and we're working towards that economic sustainability uh, for the tribe through them to help, you know, it's not a cure all or a big, but it, but it certainly helps with that. The other thing, the most important thing that, that you know, I really, um, importance of ITBC and bringing Buffalo back to, to our, our lands is one of the things, you know, um, 
in talking about in, invasive species, and, and, and I really do, you know, joke about it of um, the non-Indians and, and the cattle here taking over our lands. Um, you know, buffalo are, are a naturally uh, migrating animal, and so they were really good for the land where they uh, they don't if they're not fenced in and have enough room to roam, and that's what they were was naturally. Uh, roaming animals, and they always took care of the land. Um, they didn't overgraze. They didn't. They didn't uh, stay on the river banks and and kill riparian areas. Uh, so they were really good stewards of the land, um, and that's one of the things that that I I think that really is good with um, the animal with buffalo of uh, being a part of back with us and being on the land for us is being the good stewards and also taking care of the land. Um, and a big part of that is the culture part of it. Um, it's a real, um, like I say, there's a lot of things that we've lost, you know, that through the years, you know, they come in and they say, well, um, you've, um, your way of religion is no good. Your language is not right. You gotta be our way. You gotta be farmers, you gotta be ranchers. And, um, and, and all of these things were taken from us as a lover. And especially we really lost here is our culture, our language, um, not the culture is a big part of it, but the language, um, the buffalo had been gone so long from our people that when I first brought buffalo back here, we, we uh, it was a hard thing to get our people to really accept they'd been gone so long um, even with, you know, I was raised by my grandparents and, um, even they did not remember, you know, the Buffalo being here. So they've been out of our people's lives for so many years that it, it took a lot of educated and a lot of, um, a lot of, um, just a movement to, to always talk to the people about them, bring them back into our ceremonies, let them realize that, um, we, um, that they were a big part of our culture that we had lost or that was taken from us. Um, you know, they, um, to me, they were hunted to near extinction. And there was a reason for that. The reason for that was they thought if they get rid of the buffalo, consequently, they get rid of the, the Indian people. And uh, to this day, the buffalo are still here. Um, and we're still here. And the buffalo are thriving. We're helping them thrive. And they're, they're bringing back to us a big part of our culture that we lost and a big healthy side too to us of um, a healthy um, food that we were used to and that our people came back, get back to eating. So there was, you know, they'd been gone so long that it was a, um, even a, a real educating of our people and getting them to realize the importance of, of Buffalo to us. Now we have a project that we call the ENE project and in, in it's um, ENE is in our language is Buffalo and has to restore Buffalo, um, free roaming Buffalo back to our countries. And, um, and so after we had that and a lot of talks with our elders, um, about two years, you know, of all of this dialogue and talking and, and bringing back and now our people realize how important um, buffalo are to us and uh, as our culture as a big part of our, our diet um, and along with bringing back a lot of the other foods that that we really need within our our lives uh, to make us healthier and where these animals even make us healthier in many other ways you know our spirituality uh, and help and bring to me that's um, my part I guess that I can contribute to uh, to helping our people, not only with my tribe, but the 70 uh, tribes and, and ITBC grows every year, uh, more tribes join and bring animals back, bring buffalo back to their, to their lands. Um, that's my passion is to be able, my part of being able to bring back this culture that was taken, taken from us for so many years and, and helping to bring that back um, to, to them. Um, and, and we're there. There's, there's still a lot of uh, here in Montana and other states. There's, uh, we have a lot of hurdles that we have. Um, we have a constant fight from the, uh, 
the livestock owners in, in the states. And um, I'm constantly right now in the past few years at the legislature uh, fighting bills that are against Buffalo and um, in bringing them into our lands. So there's always that resistance that we have to go through day in and day out of uh, returning you know, our culture and returning these animals. But um, I think us as Indian people are, are used to those in, in everything that we do. Um, there's always a, a hurdle that we have to get over. If we get over one and then we have another one is thrown on us. That happens a lot here with, uh, with bringing back Buffalo to, um, to Indian country. And um, it's a constant battle, but it's my passion to be a part of that um, and bringing that back for our people and, and for their health, you know, not only um, spiritually and culturally, but, you know, um, just for the well being and for ourselves of, of bringing back that cultural part of it that was taken from us. So, those are the things what ITBC is about of, um, of returning um, Buffalo back to uh, our. our uh, to uh, Indian country, you know, 54 tribes out there that have herds. Um, like I say, a lot of them are in different different parts and simply for uh, the cultural purposes and for um, having a diet, having them back in their diet. And then and then also now to the bigger tribes with the bigger land base of, um, of the marketing. You know, in, in ITBC, we have an office in Rapid City, South Dakota, and then we, um, we uh, are always constantly, out. we uh, work with the, the U.S. government of getting money out to our tribes to help build their herds, build their infrastructure, and help them to be, you know, on their lands. Uh, we provide that, um, help them start their herds, and then um, just go forth in whatever direction that they are. But it's a real big um part you know talk about what we've lost you know as as indigenous people you know um in buffalo to us is, is a real big thing that we had lost so as i say it's a real passion of mine uh bringing those back just on a note am i past my eight eight minutes or close <laughs> yes well, don't I worry, think... thank you so much I mean, it was, it's a great presentation and, and I'm always really fascinated by everything that you share, the importance of the Buffalo, the spiritual connection, bringing back those, those real needs for the people to not only survive, but thrive. And, uh, you know, we have, well, we will have more time to come back and uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, some more questions. Uh, we have uh, two other speakers uh, that will come on. And after those two speakers, we're going to open it up to questions. So I'm sure some folks will uh, have some uh, more questions for you. So please hang on. And thank you again, you know, for sharing all of that. I really like that uh, cattle as the invasive species. I, I think that's a good one. And uh, we can agree on that one. Okay, so um, right now, I want to go to our next speaker, which is Juan Leon Alvarado. He's a uh, Alvarado. He's the uh, Maya Quiche. He is the IITC Guatemala Office Coordinator in Guatemala, calling in from Guatemala. I saw that Juan Leon had a little bit of uh, issue with the translation. Is that resolved now, Juan? Okay, Juan, when you, when you are ready, please unmute yourself and you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm going to give a very brief presentation. It's just an introduction on the situation of indigenous peoples of the Americas that we just want to remember that in 2002, we had the occasion to have a gathering, an inter-American gathering at the uh, Lago Atitlan or Atitlan Lake. It was April 17th through the 19th of 2002. That was 19 years ago. 
and among many leaders and organizations of the Americas, we were able to raise the issues about different topics that keep us alive uh, physically, spiritually, and that has to do with production, planting our seeds, and the entire process of food security. And at that time, we were seeing that there was a lot of different situation of confrontation, the loss of values of indigenous peoples in their nutrition, their food, in faced with the industrialization of our foods throughout the world. And for that reason, we set forth to have this meeting and from this came the declaration of Atitlan in Guatemala. It's very famous now, thanks to International Indian Treaty Council, because at that time there ha they had an office in Guatemala and IITC coordinated all the activities for this event. I just want to remind remember some of the objectives that brought us together at that time and i do believe that this continues to unite us and to continue to struggle for our physical mental uh, psychological spiritual health of indigenous peoples at that time our objective was to raise before the states the right to food in accordance with uh, our aspirations as indigenous peoples to strengthen the um, connections between indigenous peoples and in order to formulate st strategies from the vision from our worldview and from our understanding of the world as indigenous peoples in order to raise forth propositions and solutions for the world and for the international community and also for the those that have the different cooperatives what type of production what kind of seeds or so on will be used in our in our countries our communities so from then on there have been many interesting projects a lot of interest a lot of research has come out of this and although we have not been able to develop these strategies to uh, together from the indigenous peoples organizations with the country states or the member states i do believe that we do have some agreements and we do have very interesting ideas and I do believe that Ro Rosalina Tuyuk is going to tell us about this experience and all that she has gone through when she's facing all the problems that women face, that indigenous women face, the Mayan women face, and also remembering the context here in, in Guatemala of the survival of indigenous peoples in the midst of all the re political repression that we went through, the social military repression that has left a lot of our people, has um, left a lot of a huge aftermath of ecological problems, pain, suffering, loss of life. And amidst all of this, our people do everything that we can to continue developing ourselves. Today, we have new plans. We have new uh, approaches that we want to use, but our main goal is to continue developing as a people. And this is tied with, with the principles of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of the United Nations and the Declaration of the Americas of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of the OAS and other international instruments like the International Convention on the ILO 169 on indigenous peoples, tribes in independent countries. So I do want to give you all a warm greeting from, from Guatemala, from the Mayan territory here in Guatemala. And I now 
look forward to having this alliance, this cooperation, this interchange. And for that reason, I'm very grateful to IITC and to Andrea Carmen for sponsoring this in space for an exchange of knowledge and learning from one another. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Juan Leon, uh, for that great, wonderful presentation and also for uh, reminding us about the declaration of Atitlan. Uh, we have uh, put the declaration uh, into the chat. If people want to download that, you can see this declaration uh, right now uh, in English and Spanish uh, off the IITC website, and you can download that to get a little more background uh, of what uh, Juan Leon was just discussing. But thank you so much for uh, bringing the international uh, fora where we discuss uh, these issues into uh, perspective and focus on uh, this subject that we're speaking about today. Well, right now, uh, we want to move on to our next speaker. Remember that we'll be hearing from the speakers first, and then after uh, the presentations, we'll open it up uh, for some interactive dialogue. Um, we have a question coming in now about the presentation being recorded for viewing. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, these will be available at the IITC's uh, YouTube page. All the recordings from our uh, webinar, pretty much most all of them, uh, have been put up at the IITC YouTube page. So you can uh, access, if you missed any of them, you can access them uh, there. Uh, one other note uh, before I uh, make the introduction of our final speaker is that our speaker, uh, Bumpy Kanahele, uh, because of some weather conditions uh, going on in Hawaii, um, he's not able to log on, but we will uh, attempt to bring him back uh, either next week or in another upcoming webinar. So uh, thank you to uh, Bumpy uh, for uh, being here with us, and we look forward to hearing the rest of your presentation uh, when you come back around. Right now, uh, let me introduce our final speaker, uh, Rosalina Tuyuk. She's Maya Kachikel. She's the general coordinator of the National Coordination of Widows of Guatemala of, or Conavigua. Rosalina, thank you for being here. Uh, when you're ready, please unmute and you have the floor. Thank you very much. And first of all, I want to thank IITC and also those of you that are here for this dialogue, for us to give and share, to give and receive, to share the experiences that we have lived as indigenous peoples throughout the world and asking for permission from our ancestors, from the male and female creators. I will now begin my presentation saying that any, any part of the world, all of us, men and women, we all know that we are sons and daughters of Mother Earth. And therefore, each people we eat, we all have our own values and principles, and we also have our worldviews. And within that worldview, the Maya people today, today what governs us is the day of reciprocity with the universe, with our Mother Earth, with the air, with, with the forests, with all the waters, and also with the spirit of our grandmothers and our grandfathers. When we talk about everything that indigenous peoples have, have given to the world, really there's not enough time to say about what, how we've lived and what we've shared. But I just wanna to say to you that in order to get to the point where we are today, we have had to recover memories 
uh, history, we have to get over the fear, the terror. As Juan Leon has mentioned to you, we are survivals of a genocide, of an ethnic ethnocide. And for that reason, as we lost more than 200,000 people during that ethnocide in the decade of the 80s, then we also were started to lo lose biodiversity because in many parts, many of our forests were burned year after year for more than 36 years, more than 36 years. And this has an incalculable cost for life for our people, because in order to recover that kind of bio biodiversity, this is, we've had to start completely over, because first we had to do analysis of the story of colonialism, and then connect us, connect ourselves to life, to the experiences that we had had in agriculture, in art, in the knowledge of our people, to see when, to see when and how all this knowledge is still exists within our peoples. So we have to overcome all those types of invas invasions There's, oh, the interpreter cannot hear. There's no connection. Oh. Okay, here we go. I don't know if you hear me. Okay, then. In order to work together with Mother Earth, in order to, to work with Mother Earth in this way, we had to decolonize our agriculture. We had to decolonize our mind to decolonize also all those practices that were agrotoxics, agrochemicals that invade our original practices. And we are thankful to our creators because thanks to the life that has been given to our elders then and they are still with us they it was a we were able to recover those original practices that were so natural that have much more life to them much more flavor much more nutrition and that's why Conavigua, when faced many times, we were faced of dealing without men in our communities because they were the, the men were annihilated and during the time of the war. And those that still live in the communities, those that survived this genocide, then they were able to recover all these millinery, a thousand year old practices. And also they were able to go along to sweep out these things from our mind, all the deterioration that, that, these, ag that this agriculture that was imposed upon our cultures, we were able to sweep that away in order to improve all this link what we did is first to connect life a woman's life with life of mother earth how mother earth also if we do not take care of her if we don't protect her if we don't feed her if we don't clean her then she cannot continue to produce life and for that reason when women as women, we had to find that connection to Mother Earth. We say that if Mother Earth is sick, then the life of women is also affected. We are also sick. 
So in order to have healthy children, it is really necessary to give life to Mother Earth. And what we did, we started then to connect to Mother Earth, not just in a physical way, but also in a material way and a spiritual way. And we were able to make this change in our lives and in our attitudes. And from that, we were also able to to give back to Mother Earth, especially because she's given us so much. We started to classify the, the trash, the waste that does damage to Mother Earth. So we need to not buy, not to consume the things that, that will eventually harm the Earth. Rather, we need to consume and, and, and give our lands using organic fertilizer and using organic fertilizer in this way we have seen that women we have in our hands we have the ash we have all the things that come from the earth from the like the lime and different things that help the the vegetation to grow maybe we can't eat it like um, waste and especially other other sacred foods especially as indigenous peoples but as a, the mayan people one of the foods that is most sacred for us is is our sacred corn our sacred corn the beans and all the variety of different herbs that exist and plants that help us to be fed and for good nutrition. This is what we have to eat. And what we cannot consume, then we make a fertilizer from it. And we also using worms and we also use recycling our water because in many of our communities, there is no long, we no longer have any water. And because in time of war, when we were burning entire extensions of forests, then we lost not only the animals, we lost also the great am amount of insects, flor flowers, and also we lost a great amount of seeds. And all along with that annihilation of our forests, we were thinking that that's the, the military used to think that that's where the gorilla were hiding and that's why they burned it down. But the only thing that this has done is to rob us of trees that have been there for thousands of years. And then we also lost the our soil, that com communal soil that we had. And we also lost animals that give life to Mother Earth. And they also transport the seeds. They take one seed to another seed. To, I'm sorry, one place to another place. They transport these seeds. And that's why we were saying that when we're sharing all these thoughts, in order to improve life of mother earth we have to do all see about all that recycling and when i say we lost the life of waters i say this because when the forests were burnt when the trees were stolen then with that we love we lost the essence of the beginnings of the water. We also lost the essence of all the streams, of all the rivers. And for that reason today, it is quite difficult for us to recover that life once again, as it used to be before we had this invasion into our communities. 
And we can also say as women, we are classifying all different types of seeds. Maybe we will not to be, be able to recover all the type of seeds that we had before. Uh, we can recover maybe out of four or up to 20 types of seeds and also different types of colors, especially our sacred corn. We have our four colors of corn and it's the red, the blue, blue or black, yellow corn, and also white corn. We have also been able to recover different types of colors of beans and also different types of seeds that can give us food of our peoples and help us with our health, but also so that these seeds, even in miniature seeds, can serve as food for the animals so that they can return to us once again. And we also try to recover once again, the different varieties of fruit that we used to have before. And little by little with all these different types of fruits that were imposed upon us by the markets, and that they came from other companies that are trying to neutralize all everything that is natural. And this is another way of invading into our communities. And we have seen how helicopters, airplanes, they're always spraying a huge amounts of uh, insects so that it makes for example then avocado the uh, original man apple peach uh, all of these are contaminated quickly and for that reason through the work that conaviqua that we are doing in many of our communities we have learned we have learned, we have gained a lot of knowledge that our grandparents had before how to cultivate different types of natural bacteria in order to counteract these kinds of insects that have invaded many of our communities. We can also say that in all the work that we are doing, not only do we connect the colors with foods, the flavors of the foods, but also the sense of the food so that even though in many of our lands, maybe we don't have an abundance of land, but even if we just have a little bit of land, even just a, a small little a plot of land, then maybe it's just 40 by 40. Uh, I believe in many communities, they don't even have this amount, but wherever you can, however small space that you have, if you can, you can have a small garden and you can have agro agricultural experiences for you that we are trying to have this take place with the women of Conavigua. This has been very important for us because we are working on biodiversity and producing it, not just of plants, but also on different vegetables and fruit and flowers of medicinal plants. That has been for us been very important. And the role of many of our grandmothers, what they are doing is they are calling their children, their daughters, their grandchildren, the granddaughters to the great grandchildren, all of them in order to come to work with us, to work with us in a collective in a family way. And this has given us the good results 
in order to have food security and, and to have good nutrition, but it is really based on all of natural products. And this kind of work that we are doing with women has been very important for our youth especially and and we have been combining all of this work with the life of our animals that we have in the corral um, for example in all the fertilizer that the we get from the goats the fertilizer we get from the horses and from the chicken or any other type of animals when we get these yard animals then what we do is we use their waste in order to make fertilizers natural fertilizers in order to protect the life of mother earth and we have been experimenting with all of these different things and throughout the many years we have been doing this for about i'd say 12 10 to 12 years since we initiated this work and today for example many of our grandmothers they have gone back to the other dimension uh, life hereafter or and also there have been young women 40 50 years that they lost their mobility they lost their sight they also lost their hearing and because of arthritis arthritis they can no longer work but there are mothers that help that guide us they they guide their children their daughters they're the ones that take the lead and then these are these grandchildren are that are now have taken up to do this work of doing this work of connecting us to mother earth and we also have been working in coordination with the official schools and with the churches so that they too can help us to clean up our rivers. This is work. Rosalina? It is work that we need to do to clean up the rivers. It is also community work that we have to do because our work is is specific that's especially connected to agroecology and food sovereignty is a work that we do within the family and sometimes very com community oriented but in the end there's work that we all have to do and they are work mm -hmm. that's generalized for other sectors in order to raise an awareness and in order to heal not just to heal life for what the aftermath of the war but also to heal our rivers our forests to heal our mother earth this is a collective task that we all have of us for us gracias rosalina it's so i want to thank you all i want to say thank you and let's continue to on this path of life and i want and it's a task that a global task that we all have ahead of us thank you so much Thank you so much, uh, Rosalina Tuyuk, for that uh, incredible presentation, um, reminding us uh, really the, some of the, the tragic history in Guatemala, but also uh, reminding us about, uh, there was just so much there, uh, really about how the connection of that, the forest to the water, for example, uh, that you mentioned when they burned down the forest, how it affected the animals and how this really, you had to start from the beginning again with building your biodiversity. Incredible, incredible story, uh, incredible sharing from all of our presenters today. Uh, right now, we wanna uh, open it up to some questions. I know there was one that came in for um, Irvin. Uh, Irvin, if, uh, if I can uh, pose this first question to you while others are thinking uh, of their questions that they might wanna put in the chat, um, this first question is for you, Irvin. How does restoring native grasslands go hand in hand with restoring buffalo? How does this help with keeping grasslands intact to adapt to climate change, prevent erosion? And uh, 
you know, maybe something a little bit about the, the cattle, uh, about how they deal with the grass and what's different between the buffaloes. So uh, Irvin, would you mind uh, responding to that first question? And then we'll look for other questions coming in into the chat. Yeah. Um, you know, just as, um, you know, I talked about earlier, our cattle, um, they tend to overgraze, you know, and especially in a small area. Um, and buffalo are naturally, you know, migrating animals. And uh, if given enough room, you know, they naturally migrate and don't overgraze. And and then also they don't hang on riparian areas and, and uh, along the rivers to, to you know, to, uh, to, you know, do damage to them, to the riparian areas. But um, so, you know, if they're, they naturally don't overgraze and the, and the grasses, you know, um, you know, um, are there. So, you know, and I put on it, you know, I answered it a little earlier, the grazing, it reduces the competition between grasses and forbs and which increases the diversity of, you know, perennial forbs and also greatly increases the growth, the germination and, you know, abundance of the grass. So, um, they then they always you know it seems like they always come back to um, they're migrating and they always come back to the area where they've been before and uh, along with that not overgrazing and which helps i guess to me with um um you know with uh, the uh talking about you know the climate change um doesn't leave a bare you know ground you know from them uh so that's kind of about how um, I see with it. You know, I'm not a real uh, biologist, but you know, I, I I work with ours at ITBC and on these things, and uh, and we work. So just some of the ideas that I have from from her and uh, from the organization. But as I see it with our buffalo, you know, they're um, as long as they have enough room to roam, and we do have a lot of that for them. Um, just the, the not overgrazing as cattle do uh, is how they help restore um you know a lot of the plants that are taken away um that also that that buffalo i see that's one of the things how we ate buffalo before is medicinal plants that are really important to us um that they also ate and that what we benefited from by eating buffalo also so those are real uh, important things to us too with, with buffalo Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to open it up to any of the other speakers or Andrea, if you want to add something here. There is a comment that came into the um, chat about uh, an excellent documentary called Kiss the Ground. Uh, that's uh, being recommended. It's an inspirational message that affirms indigenous practices uh, spoken of here uh, in today's webinar, and it even offers evidence of this. So uh, I did see Andrea was going to take the floor. Sorry, Andrea, please go ahead. That's no, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment on <clears throat> listening to all of the presenters, and I know Bumpy will also finish, but he also showed in his slide you know, the impact of colonization on on the uh, integrity of the waterways there where he lives on, on Oahu in Hawaii. And also, you know, the other the other presenters, um, Irvin and, and Rosalina in particular talked about this too, the, the relationship of, of addressing uh, the history of colonization in, in some ways very brutal colonization, um, at, maybe in every way it was brutal. You know, I look at the history of Montana and Guatemala and Hawaii, you know, that, that military intervention that targeted, um, as they all talked about, um, removing the uh, vitality um, of the indigenous biodiversity in order to destroy the indigenous uh, peoples and their resistance. I just wanted to comment that I, I saw that link and how the restoration of our peoples um, is really going hand in hand in these places with bringing back our original plants, animals, and biodiversity. Um, in in a peaceful and, and harmonious way, 
Um, so I, I just want to make that point that I really saw the linkage between the different presentations and, and the history that we've suffered um, that was deliberate. Um, I mean, everyone knows the buffalo were killed, the servant said, as an act of war to subjugate uh, the people. It's the only way they could really do it. And, and Rosalina referred to that, to the impact of, um, of war, the warfare there against the people. So how, how restoring those traditional original plants and animals um, is really one of the main ways that we can continue to uh, restore our sovereignty and also uh, our resistance against these forces that have affected us and have all kinds of bad impacts in terms of our nutrition and you know our um, the health of our peoples in every way. So I don't know if either Rosalina or Irvin uh, wanted to comment on that or Juan Leon, um, that making that connection. And I really saw that link between everybody's presentation uh, addressing that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I really uh, those, those words. As a moderator, you know, I get to listen to a lot of these great programs every week, and I try not to input too much because we really try to uh, encourage our speakers. But I, I also agree with you and saw that connection to colonization. And as a Taino person, you know, I, I can uh, relate uh, to many of these things in our ancestral ways. Just, you know, one example I thought of you know, with invasive species on our island, which, you know, island uh, communities are so fragile, right? And uh, one time they brought in the uh, mongoose actually to help curb uh, uh, snakes or, or, or rats. And, and now they've taken over and they've really just wrecked havoc. Some people said they can't hear me. Uh, maybe check what channel you're on. Uh, are other people having problems hearing me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah, so other yeah, people say that they can hear me, but um, all right, just checking, but just very quickly to wrap that up, uh, you know, the mong that introduction of the mongoose, people thinking that that was a good idea to uh, curb uh, the rat population, et cetera. Um, Roberto, I can't hear you. I don't know if others have the problem as well. I'm trying uh, to. I don't know. Uh, some people are saying they can hear me. Other people are saying it's quiet. Um, so I don't know what's what's going on. Uh, I, I think more people are saying they can hear me, Andrea. But uh, let's let's go there. Just wanted to add uh, that you know these these uh, this introduction of invasive species has, has just been so devastated, uh, devastating on so many indigenous communities. We had another problem also with the introduction of the lionfish in our waters. And that's been a big focus of our community to go out and wherever people to see the uh, lion, when they go out into the waters, they see the lionfish, they, they try to eradicate them because they just eat up so many of the, of the native fish. It really makes an impact on our community's uh, food security, really. So uh, Irvin or Juan Leon, uh, please, if you'd like to add anything uh, about what Andrea says that linked to colonization or anything else you feel that you might have uh, missed in your presentation, uh, please feel free to share. Or Rosalina as well. You know, um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Um, just, you know, talking about that, uh, the colonization and the invasive species, you know, um, ITBC, one of the... Um, the big things that, that we fight and been doing for a lot of years is the uh, trying to bring buffalo out of uh, Yellowstone Park uh, alive and out to tribes. And the big fight that we have there um, is these uh, is brucellosis. And um, so to me, you know, and they, we always have that fight of where it, this is out that brucellosis is, is um, is transferred to cattle and causes them to abort. Um, it's all blamed on a buffalo. And actually uh, a big part of it is from uh, elk, but um, they never mention, you know, um, the elk, but buffalo, elk could be out all over the land by, you know, by hundreds and then nothing said. And then one buffalo, just one buffalo walk out on that land 
and then people are all up in arms about it. And so it's an issue that we've been fighting for a lot of years, the brucellosis. But where did that brucellosis come from? It came from that invasive species of, of cattle. You know that when cattle came from a foreign country and, and brought diseases here to uh, to to uh, here in the Americas, of um, not only to to the animals but even also to us as Indi indigenous people, like uh, our tribe from smallpox was nearly wiped out. Um, so those things like that, you know, are, are the colonization of, you know, and moving, well, having us to be into their ways. Um, these buffalo at, at Yellowstone, which we fight for bringing out live, they're, uh, we kind of, I look at us as being right side by side by them, one and one, you know, as Indian people here. Uh, we were put on reservations and weren't allowed to leave. We weren't even citizens for a while in our own country and allowed to vote and things like that, or even leave the reservation. And that's the way the Yellowstone Buffalo were there. They were, they were put in there, but of course it saved, you know, them, but also they weren't allowed to leave. And um, when they came out of there, in the beginning, those, those, um, on the, the, um, the people that were in charge that when they came out of the park, they would just, they would say, and they would slaughter them animals. And so we fought that long and hard and we got that stopped and uh, working on quarantine processes now and, um, and getting them out to uh, the tribes alive. So those are some of the things that I, I, I think that, you know, that were just put upon us, you know, as Indian people and put on our reservations. And um, a lot of our reservation used to be quite big and, uh, and just slowly it was opened up to, uh, to settlers, you know, in, in the land taken from us and given to them to down to where we're at now. And even now, you know, people come into our lands and, and want to take over that. But um, it's kind of one and the same that I look at with us right along with Buffalo of the things that we have to go through because of all of this um, going into their way of life, being living their way of life, forced upon us to change our ways take their culture or language or culture away and, and um, live their way, you know, and it's a hard thing. And that's why we ITBC are bringing all of this back to, to bring our ways back. Thank you so much for that, Urban. Uh, great, great points that you've raised there. Uh, I wanna just give a quick opportunity to Juan Leon or Rosalina to make a, a very brief uh, closing comment or anything that they want to add. Again, very brief because we just have five minutes left uh, for today's uh, webinar. Thank you. I see that we face many challenges, many challenges for us to overcome, things that we need to do together but aside from invasive species to uh, that are affecting our territories our biodiversity i'm really concerned about the colonialism that we were mentioning the new forms of interacting with the, the with the other that the, our youth are learning things that i call invasive thoughts at least in Guatemala, there is a, a process to disarticulate indigenous peoples uh, uh, of our way of thinking, of our way of being. Adults are more concerned in keeping our culture alive, keeping our rights protected, both collective and individual in a holistic fashion. But the youth, with the new thoughts that come in, with new musics, with religions, with uh, political thought, corruption, impunity, that is very harmful. That's the most harmful challenge that I see, aside from us taking care of our food sovereignty to, to rescue our food natural food as well as our values. I thank you for the, the opportunity to speak and I'll see, see the 
the floor to the next person who's going to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosalina, do you have any closing comments? Muchas gracias, Rosalina. ¿Algún comentario de clausura? Um, yeah. And I'm hearing the, the Spanish interpretation on the English channel. Uh, but uh, yes, Rosalina, you have the floor. Uh, yes, I'd like yes. to thank everyone for this opportunity to, to speak, to reflect on all these harmful effects on our lives, on our agriculture, on our thought, this attack that is constant. And in, we need to continue working through uh, schooling, places where we analyze these critical points and an education that take place, takes place from our vision, the vision for, of our peoples, because all these species now, all these harmful species that affect our water, our mother earth, our seeds are being sold to us. By saying, oh, you know, it's needed. It's needed for development in schools, universities, the youth, even as small children, they are being told that the agriculture that indigenous peoples practice, it's inadequate, it makes no sense, it doesn't make financial sense. And when they say that, the youth, the, the teenagers, start believing that in fact, working a, a plot of maize, of flowers, is not profitable. Nevertheless, I believe that we need to do the work to counteract every second, every minute, those attacks, always aware that to achieve the biodiversity that we seek, we must do away once again of those other forms of education that we are receiving. And I believe that through the constant work that we do as indigenous peoples, we know that it's worth doing this work that results have been achieved. And with this, we have shown that it is possible to do it. And it's not a matter of being profitable or not. It's truly about focusing on the life, on full-fledged life and the connection with the human beings and mother nature and spirituality. I believe that through this work, work we must be done hard with the youth, boys and girls, and old teenagers, and push, push for the, all of them. They're working on this and let them know that there's still a lot of work to do in terms of intergenerational dialogues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rosalina, for those final words. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Again, Rosalina Tuyuk, uh, Juan Leon Alvarado, Irvin Carlson, and also to Bump Bumpy Kanaheli uh, for being here. He had to, he wasn't able to uh, continue, but we will bring him back on soon. Uh, also, thank you to Andrea Carmen, who provides the introduction and, and uh, gets these webinars together. I want to thank uh, Chris Honani for working on our tech and our behind the scenes, as well as our interpreters, Daniel and Rebecca, uh, for being here and providing that excellent interpretation. Uh, my name is Roberto Mucaro Borrero, and I am hoping that you will tune in uh, next week uh, for our next installment of this series. We'll be focusing on restoring and protecting our waterways. Again, restoring and respecting, protecting, respecting and protecting our waterways. I added that respecting in there, but uh, it's kind of a given. Uh, we'll have uh, speakers from Canada, uh, New Zealand, and also an introduction from uh, Janine Yazi um, as well. So I really hope that you can all tune in. You can uh, check out these webinars. Uh, you can sign up for them once you uh, go to register for one. You can actually register for the other ones that are coming up. Uh, 
later in the in in the series. So again, on behalf of the International Indian Treaty Council, I thank all of you for tuning in today. Thank you for those who uh, shared questions and comments. Again, thank you to our speakers, and we will end the webinar uh, right now. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for having me.